The BenQ PD3220U is a monitor that's been made for designers and professionals. Indeed, it sports a 31.5 inch IPS panel that runs UHD at 60Hz. It has also been professionally calibrated and has also got Thunderbolt 3 connectivity, making it ideal for Mac users. Now in this video that has been kindly sponsored by BenQ, I'll be covering everything you need to know about the monitor, which at the time of filming can be found for £1,020 in the UK and $1,100 in the US. Now to kick off this video I would like to talk about connectivity, and here you've got two HDMI 2.0 inputs and a singular DisplayPort 1.4 input. These are capable of outputting 4K at 60Hz, whereby the latter also is capable of outputting at up to 10 bit. Now elsewhere you have also got those Thunderbolt 3 ports, one of which is able to have deliver up to 85 watts of power and also can be used to display data and also your picture, making it handy if you're plugging in a laptop. Furthermore, you've also got daisy chaining capabilities via the secondary Thunderbolt 3 output. This is capable of delivering up to 15 watts of power. Now elsewhere, the monitor has got a built-in KVM switch, which means that you can plug in your peripherals directly into your monitor and seamlessly switch between different sources without having to plug and unplug your mouse or keyboard. Now in order to facilitate this, there is a singular USB type B input that is found underneath the monitor, which can be handy to plug in to your desktop computer, which resides next to two USB type A 3.1 ports. Now past that, on the right hand side of the monitor, you've got another USB type A 3.1 port and a USB type C port. Then you've also got a 3.5mm jack which can be handy for plugging in your headphones directly into the monitor or of course you can use the built in 2x2 watt speakers. Now past all of that let's talk about the monitor's performance and as a reminder it's got a 31.5 inch flat IPS panel that runs UHD at up to 60Hz. It's actually been factory calibrated out of the box and has got certifications from the likes of Kalman, Pantone and Solidworks. Better still, you have got flicker-free technology with a low blue light filter, should you wish to enable it, and it's also got HDR capabilities, whereby an HDR10 signal can be fed through the monitor. Now in order for me to give my own objective test, I've used my own calibrators and also used the dedicated modes that can be selected through the monitor's OSD, such as sRGB, Adobe RGB, DCI-P3 and Display-P3. Now first off, concentrating on sRGB, you can see the results on your screen, with a gamut coverage of 92.3% in the colour space and a gamut volume of 95.9%. Below you can see how it compares to the sRGB standard. As for the average Delta E, it sits at 1.18, with a maximum sitting at 4.01. The tested contrast ratio was 748 to 1, with the measured white point pretty on point at 6601 Kelvin at 100%. Here below you can see how it compares to the 2.2 gamma standards. Now next up we've got the display P3 mode, and here you can see that the gamma coverage and gamma volume have increased across the board. Indeed below you can see how it compares to the display P3 standard, not to be confused with the sRGB mode that I just referenced. Equally, the colour accuracy was benchmarked against the Display P3 standard and you can see that the average Delta E sits at 1.58 and the maximum sits at 6.61. The tested contrast ratio doesn't change and the measured white point sits at 6602 Kelvin at 100%. Below you can see how it compares to the Gamma 2.2 standard. So shifting our attention away from that, we get onto Adobe RGB, and here you can see that the gamma coverage sat at 79% and the gamma volume of 82.4%. Below you can see how it compares to the Adobe RGB standard. Here again, the average Delta E and maximum Delta E translate to the Adobe RGB mode, and indeed over here you can see they sit at 2.47 and 5.17 respectively. The measured white point does shift a little bit and gets even closer at 6,449 Kelvin at 100%. That is against the 6,504 Kelvin target. 
As for the gamma curve, it again sits pretty close to the 2.2 standards. Finally, we get onto the DCI-P3 mode, and here you can see that the gamma coverage has changed to 94.2% and 98.6% for the coverage and volume respectively. Below, again, comparing it to the DCI-P3 mode, you can see how it compares to what the reference is. Here again, via the average delta E and maximum delta E, these are benchmarked against the DCI-P3 modes, where the average delta E sits at 1.43 and a maximum of 5.61. As for the measured white point, it sits at 6,132 Kelvin at 100%, and given the slightly different gamma curve of DCI-P3, it was compared to the 2.6 standards. Now for those who have a keen eye, you would have noticed the brightness level would have switched. And indeed here, the sRGB and display pre-3 modes have got a maximum of 182 nits and a minimum of 21 nits. While the Adobe RGB and the DCI-P3 modes sit higher at 247 nits and 41 nits respectively. As for HDR, it bypasses the different color modes and therefore gives you a maximum of 251 nits. Now past its peak luminance, you can see the brightness uniformity that I was able to attain, at least on my tested panel, in the sRGB mode and also the display P3 modes. This did shift when I went to the Adobe RGB and DCI-P3 modes. Finally, when it came to the backlight bleeds, you can see how my tested panel performed in a variety of different angles. So moving on, we get onto the monitor's OSD, and here it can be accessed through a physical joystick button found behind the monitor, or via the included hotkey Puck G2. Now here, via the monitor's OSD, you can see a plethora of different options, such as within the input tab, you've got the PIP, PBB, and PBP times 4 settings that you can adjust. Within the picture mode, where applicable, you've got the brightness, contrast, sharpness, and advanced modes, where you can even enable the dynamic contrast if you so wish. As for the color mode preset, you have got the variety of different preset color modes which have been calibrated and the ones that I've of course touched upon before. And then of course you've got the user mode preset. Here you've also got the ability to enable or disable dual view, which I'll touch upon very shortly. The color temperature, which you can adjust and also go via user defined setting if you so wish. Then you've also got an advanced tab where you've got the gamma, the hue, the saturation, and also the AMA settings, all of which are definitely appreciated. As for the audio tab, you've got the volume, and of course you can mute it as well. Here you've also got the KVM switch, where you can switch between the different inputs, or indeed have it auto switch if you so wish. As for the custom keys, they can be changed, and these are the buttons found behind the monitor, where you've got the custom key one and two. Equally, the controller, in other words, the hotkey Puck G2, where it has got three different settings, you can also adjust these, in other words, to change between what they actually mean, and this can be quite handy as well if you're quickly switching between different settings or indeed via different inputs. Speaking of which, you can also adjust the rotation key and also the controller key dial. Finally, in terms of the system settings, you've got the OSD settings themselves. You've also got the ability to have a little bit of a reminder for your ergonomics, keeping a good sort of posture. The power awake, which you can enable or disable for the Thunderbolt 3 and also USB. And then via the advanced settings, you can enable or disable the DDC slash CI setting, the auto power off, and also you can adjust the display port version. You're probably going to want to go on the 1.4 model. Then over here, you've finally got the system settings, which gives you a little indication of the brightness and of course the resolution and refresh rate that the monitor is currently running on. Now past the hardware-based OSD, you have also got a software called Display Pilot. It very much complements the hardware-based OSD and still gives you a plethora of different options that you can adjust on the fly. Better still, you've also got the dual view function, which I briefly touched upon before. Here it allows you to have different workflows, in other words work in two different color spaces, all while looking at the same screen. Very handy if you've got multiple projects going on at once, or indeed just want to compare and contrast. Speaking of which, you have also got simplified color synchronization via the use of ICC Sync, which effectively synchronizes the color profiles between your monitor and your computer. 
very handy if you specifically have a Mac as you've got a dedicated M book mode that you can select through the monitor's OSD and effectively allows you to closely match the different displays. Now past all of this, the 31.5 inch monitor has got a four side borderless design and therefore should fit in most sort of desktop setups. Better still, the sturdy stand provides you height, tilt, pivot and swivel adjustments, all of which are definitely appreciated for you to get the best sort of ergonomics. Of course, if you do not want to use the built-in stand, you can replace it via a Visa 100x100mm stand, allowing you to place it on a multi-monitor setup or of course a monitor arm. So there we have it, hopefully you've enjoyed my detailed overview of the BenQ PD3220U. I'd be curious to know what you make of the monitor down in the comment section below, and of course if you've liked this video, definitely do consider dropping a like, subscribing and hitting that bell notification, all of which would be greatly appreciated. As such, I've been totally dubbed, and I'll hopefully see you in the next one. Take care of yourselves, and goodbye.